Welcome to the January 8, 2018 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. May we please have the roll call by the town clerk. Chairman Sullivan? Yeah. Here. Councilor Garvin? Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Councilor Penelope Jordan? Councilor Lennon? Here. Councilor Randall? Here. And Councilor Straw? Here. Thank you. Uh, both uh, Councillors Kaylin and Penny Jordan have uh, let us know that they have other commitments this evening and will not be attending. Councillor Kaitlyn Jordan may, may make it, but significantly later in the evening. Could we please uh, have our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, do any councils have correspondence or reports they'd like to give? Councilor Lennon? Um, for the listening audience, I just wanted to say that the Comprehensive Planning Committee will hold its first um, public meeting on January 25th, a Thursday night at 7 o'clock here. Um, and I would really encourage people to come. I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be interesting. We're going to do some click polling and group conversations and small groups. And um, there'll be some structure and some time for you to express anything you're interested in about the comprehensive plan. We're going to have good snacks, including fresh popped popcorn and healthy fruit salad and desserts. So um, please come. And if you have any questions, uh, you can email the council. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I have a few things I'd like to say. Uh, I'd certainly <laughs> like to thank our Public Works Department for all their hard work over some very snowy and very cold days. <laughs> um, and uh, to remind the public that on February 1st at 7 p.m., there is a public forum to gather information from citizens uh, concerning their views on paper streets. There's also a second one on February 3rd at 10 a.m. Uh, both are, are at the Town Center Fire Station and these are moderated meetings. I'd also like to thank, I believe, Wendy Durzawick, but who has developed on the website a How Do I tab on the town website. I don't know if anyone has noticed this yet, but I think it's terrific and she has listed a bunch of uh, frequently asked questions and uh, it's it's a great list so I hope everyone will get a chance to take a look at that and I think it was very well done and so I'll turn it over to Matt for the uh, finance committee report well if you have any report or correspondence um, oh those for town council I'm sorry I'm jumping ahead yeah for the uh, finance committee um, financial report and dashboard and finance committee for Matt and also for council Garner. Um, yeah, I would just point out, um, and Matt can detail for us, um, in addition to the regular dashboard view that we have to, um, in the packet this month, there's also a full comprehensive report of the calendar year end um, of all of the, um, of all of the accounts uh, for detail. So if you have questions about those, or Matt, if you want to call out anything specific relative to the dashboard or the report. Sure. Thank you, Councilor Garvin. Yep. Uh, one thing I'd like to note, uh, Pursuant to Councilor Strauss' question last month, we will, uh, as of next month, start printing these to, to PDF so they'll be cleaner and hopefully easier to read and, and to post. So, uh, work with the Finance Department, they'll be making that live fairly soon. So, should anticipate next month to be set up that way. Um, from the financial side of it, we are still showing some great growth, or some we're tracking fairly robustly on excise taxes as well as building permits uh, from one year over the next. Uh, we're, we're still showing sustained sustained improvement on both of those areas. Uh, the one area that I will find under expenditures is we, we will now know that it is winter. Uh, when you look at a couple of different areas, uh, specifically to public works, our uh, salt and, uh, uh, and our overtime uh, on both reflect to the fact that winter has come, come back uh, strongly, which we were anticipating, uh, but those two areas there will show that we're tracking where we should be. Um, but overall, no surprises. Uh, I do have one other additional point that I, I will follow up with during the manager's report as well, uh, noted to, to town finances, specific to tax, uh, property tax receipts. All right. So, any questions on the dashboard? The only other thing I'll add from a finance 
perspective is we all just came out of a um, joint session with the school board uh, where we reviewed the um, findings of our um, most recent audit and the good news is that it was a clean audit with no material weaknesses. Um, the details of uh, all the findings were included in the meeting packet. If people refer to that online, they'd be able to find that information. Um, so just want to make that announcement as well. That's all, right. all I have. Thank you. Yep. Uh, next is uh, an opportunity for citizens to come to the council uh, to discuss something uh, that is not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone here wishing to do that? All right, seeing no one. Do we now have the town manager's monthly report? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'd like to start that the, the close of the year was extremely busy at Tax Collection Department with the recent changes to the income tax laws. With the adjustment of itemized deductions that took place specific to local and state taxes paid, there was an end of the year rush by many residents to pay the second half tax payments due in April in order to have this amount included in their 2017 itemized deduction on their federal income taxes. To provide perspective uh, to people to understand how heavily this hit in the town, last December the town received just under $130,000 in real estate property tax receivables in the month of December. While this year December showed a receivable of just over $2.85 million in payments. <laughs> Let that sink in for a second. That, now, I'd like to take the opportunity for one to thank uh, Assistant Town Manager Deb Deborah Lane and her staff for processing all of that. Uh, she would call me on a da daily basis to report the amount of receivables that came in overnight electronically, and it was staggering. And the fact that they did that all within the last 12 days of the month of December. That's when, because you think about the timing of when everything passed, that's when the proverbial uh, tax bill hit the fan. <laughs> Additionally, I want to take the moment to recognize and thank our Public Works Department, as, as Chairman Sullivan said, uh, they have had a challenging three weeks at best. Uh, the recent storms could have had, had not had a more difficult time in regards to the Christmas holiday, as well with icing and two significant snowfalls and one of them happening specifically on Christmas Day uh, for folks to come out. They had planned ahead and, they, and, the, and the team was ready to go, but that is, if you think about a challenge, that is a very heavy one to leave family on those days and they did it and I want to say thank you for them. They have performed extremely well and I'm grateful for their efforts. I, I took a moment on Friday to stop in when uh, some very tired gentlemen were having lunch just to thank them because uh, they do some great work and, as well as their director. Uh, we'll hear from possibly later in this evening. So, um, And again as Councilor, as Councilor Sullivan, Chairman Sullivan had noted specific to the goal setting session and Councilor Lennon's request to have a home base for frequently asked questions. Uh, I want to thank Wendy Derswick for that. She did a great job. I uh, followed up with her on that immediately after and she tried to put that into play as well as providing an introductory story on the website. I thought that was helpful to try to get people to understand that they can find that information that hopefully they'll find and that may be dynamic as we go forward where you know, other things that may, you know, may be more popular. I will say what he did uh, identify to me that still the number one traffic area on our website is the assessor's database. <laughs> so uh, that, as an old assessor, that uh, made me still happy. The last thing I want to report on is uh, is the park manager. I would like to just give you a brief update, if I could, uh, related to that concept. I'm trying to take advantage of. Uh, well, we had we've had a couple of challenges that took place over the coming over the past year with Russell Packett, who was our Community Services Director, and his unfortunate passing. Uh, when something like that happens, you find it as a challenge, but you also find it as an opportunity. And looking at the challenge that we have as far as managing the park, I looked at this as maybe this would now be an opportunity for us to look at it from a different approach uh, relative to the park manager position. What I did was sit down with uh, Bob Malley and Kathy Raptus, who's been our interim Community Services Director and Jean Gross, and as well as Perry Schwartz, who's our Facilities Director, and try to you know, sit down and identify some of the areas that they're looking at and some of the duties that take place at the park. And thought, geez, you know, one one day on my way home, I was thinking, why don't we look into blending this into the Community Services Department? Part of my concern was, with this being a new position or a new new area. 
is number one, justifying it, how we can fund something like that. Number two is what are the challenges as far as establishing a new department and the things that come with it as far as the infrastructure for, for supporting that department. Realizing that there are departments that are already taking components of what we do uh, at the park as far as you know, organizing, uh, uh, setting up the, the timetable for the picnic shelter, rentals, or other, uh, other facilities and thought, geez, it's a town park. Towns have parks and recreation department, community services has a lot of that. They also have the infrastructure for scheduling. They have office space. They have uh, also a lot of the facilities that we're going to need. So instead of going down there and saying, okay, we're going to need a director, we're going to need uh, administrative assistant to help that director because when the person is out of there to, to take care of phone calls and other concerns that may come up, uh, they're going to need office space, they're going to need furniture, they're going to need software, computers, the whole shooting match. And then I'm not sure at other times of the year, is that going to be, or would that be two positions or one position that would have justifiably 40 hours a week to, to, to do that? There are things that happen throughout the course of the year, but maybe I can't ha I'd have a hard time justifying that 12 months out of the, out of the year. Also noting at the fact that we had at Community Services a need for additional programming. So during the, you know, during the more busy months of the year, we'd be looking at you know, really, in, in a sense, from April to November, when the highest traffic rates take place at the park, we could have this person dedicated specifically to the issues that take place at the park and trying to figure out that workflow and the areas and the issues that need to be managed. Whereas in those intervening months from November to say April, there may not be as much demand on it. There's still plenty, there's still things to do and, and plans to be made, but, uh, but it may not be to that extent. So one thought was, could we have a seasonal person? But I also know at community services, they have programming that's needs that aren't being met. And we do have seniors that we, we should be providing more programming to and other age groups, and we could really diversify what we provide at the community services level for programming as well. So we could kind of tap on that person to, to, to be a specialist in that area for the board, but then also uh, we do have other, other people who work there who may be able to make that load lighter as well. So my thought is to have community services director be the direct report to both Fort Williams Park Committee as well as community services advisory committee and fold that under their, under their area of, of influence, I guess, would be the way to, to look at that. But then also they'll be working with public works as well as facilities where the areas that, that are done well, you know, as our, like our parks crew who, who take care of the maintenance and the management of, of the grounds, they'll still, be with, you know, they'll still be with public works. And facilities would still take care of the 326 building and the officers' road buildings that we have down there as well as taking care of the infrastructure. But this person would then, could then address some issues as far as the scheduling of the buses, uh, working with the trolley operators, as well as the other myriad of different things that, you know, quite frankly, Bob's done day in and day out for years uh, in majority way. So uh, to that end, this Thursday, I'll be uh, interviewing for a new community services director. Uh, so hopefully we'll have that position filled fairly soon. And then after that, We'll work on working on that job description based on my conversations with the department heads who've been involved specifically with with the park related issues and then trying to define uh, what that job description will be for that programmer and the person who may be assisting on those areas at, at the park that's that's pretty much where i'm at right now sarah i'm oh, sorry sorry sarah, sarah. Chair. is that a question um, so are you picturing that the community services director would have would allocate to some of the, their staff various things, for example, rentals, like someone's having a wedding there and they want someone to meet them and talk about this and that. I can't imagine the director of community services is going to have time for the many, many details of rentals and events and requests for events and setting pricing and all that. So. Are you picturing that there might be a part-time person there, or maybe there's a person already there who would be half something and half something else? And my other question is, um, like we had discussed a little bit bigger, bigger picture thinking about generating revenue. I know that's our job, but um, 
again, who are you picturing would do that? Would that be the community service director working with us on sort of more big picture aspirational plans for the port, for, let's say? I, I think that would be, be the approach with the, the community service director would work as well as, you know, with myself and the council as, and the park committee uh, to try to figure out that. That's a whole other area of discussion, you know, such things as pay display parking and uh, things along those lines that I think are, are paradigm shift discussions that probably take place, quite frankly, with the, with the seven members of the council. Um, but as far as, you know, finding it to be sustainable and to, to fund positions and, and to fund operations down there, those are, yeah, those are 10,000 foot items that, that fall into the council's area, but I'd be, we'd be happy to work on that end of it. But as far as the person who meets, uh, you know, interested bride and groom uh, who would like to come to the fort, they, were, they would have st uh, staff person that would probably be dedicated to the to the heavy part of the year, or if they you know they could strike they could stagger their their scheduling so you'd have a person who'd be there Monday through Friday and then Saturday and Sunday you'd have coverage as well so you could have staff on board that could that could meet those needs uh, versus if you know if they if they weren't there on Saturday and Sunday then they wouldn't find an answer but you could you could find that as well as the other thought would be uh, programming at the at Fort Williams for community services where you know, we have, it is ultimately the town of Cape Elizabeth Park that is provided to a lot of people who are Cape Elizabeth citizens. And there may be facilities that we could use there that oftentimes, you know, you're, you're relying on the school to provide flat green space. I mean, outside of the athletic fields that we'll talk about later this evening, um, there are other times you know, that you may be able to do programming for that or uh, uh, pickleball or something along those lines uh, or tennis or you know ultimate frisbee things like that that does open up an avenue of recreation that quite frankly hasn't been employed and, and as well as trying to figure out the traffic and if that would work and the times of day that it may work but trying to get that as an asset that the, the citizens can enjoy outside of you know from 6.30 to 9 uh, and then from 5 o'clock until the gates close quite frankly during different times of the year. But I, but I think that would be, a, you know, the, the community services director would be the direct uh, liaison for both, uh, both committees. Uh, so they would work with them as well and then try to implement their, their desires through staffing levels there. Chris? Uh, Councilor Starr. So are you proposing, um, it sounds like the community service director will be the liaison to both of the committees and then they'll have one additional headcount to handle the additional workload? All right. Yep. In, in theory, we'd be adding an additional programmer, but you'd have, there are, you know, there's an, an additional programmer that's already employed for us, so you can, right now what they do, you know, for instance, for basketball, you'll have, you know, they'll, they'll stagger their workload, so on Saturday and Sunday when they have basketball games, if they're playing here, they may be staffing there, so it can, we can provide some coverage there that we may not be able to have at the present time. And then, as well as in the, in the down times, be able to provide programming support at the community services level as well. So it's kind of a, a diversity of interest that a person may have, but it may be enough to keep somebody engaged and, uh, and, and want to join the organization to do that. Um, so it sounds as if you're, you would be the, 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 the position of director, park director, Fort Williams park director, is going to be also the community services director. Now, would this be like a parks and recreation director? Yeah, or, okay, but you're going to call it the title will be community services director instead of a parks and recreation, and you would have that person would be the director of Fort Williams as well. Yes. Um, okay. Um, well, thank you. Are there any other questions or? It sounds like this, you know, there'll be more, more to come, more to come sure. on this. Uh, Councilor Strong? I, I'm curious if Bob Malley weighed in at all, uh, just because he's the one that has the most hands-on experience with how much this entails. Um, did the Director of Public Works indicate, yeah, this seems like a good... Mm -hmm. we've, we've had a few conversations, I guess, would be the understatement of the year, but yeah. uh, to be honest, I, I take Bob's opinion and, and input, input on this extremely heavily because of his experience. And, yeah. Uh, so I do run a lot of that, a lot of my ideas by him, and I guess I'm not certifiable yet. But, but no, it's it's a, it's a work in progress. But we are trying to find it, and 
uh, find the areas that still work well, you know, as far as our, you know, there are assets that are still in place that will still stay on public works side of it as well as on the facility side of it. And just trying to figure out and navigate as we go forward uh, where things should stay. Uh, but we want to do it in a cost effective manner, but also an effective manner. So we want to try to have it be the best we can have to provide there. But thank you for that question. Anyone else? Councillor Garvin? Um, thanks for laying that all out. I, I think the one thing that I would try to retain, I, I'm less concerned about the organizational model than I know when we had the workshop with the Fort Williams Committee um, towards the latter part of last year. Um, one of the sentiments that came up was the advantage to, in creating a position like this, having somebody with, you know, sort of boots on the ground in the park. And so I, I, whether those responsibilities are spread out across several different people, um, I, I'd hope that we can retain that sort of objective and concept in some way. Again, it doesn't, it doesn't concern me how the, how the department is organized so much as, as long as that, um, that need is met. Because it seemed like that was one of the clear things that we heard about um, we need to have somebody there who has time and focus and energy on, on seeing what's happening and experiencing what's going on there. So that, that would just be the one point I'd make. So. If I may yeah. uh, completely agree. I completely agree. I think that's, that's critical, especially over the t uh, course of the summer when I was going down there on a regular basis to see that. And, and you go down there and there's five buses. And, you know, I know there's a, a subcommittee set up right now from the Fort Williams Park Committee to address that as an issue, but uh, that's that's one of those areas that I do think it's important to have that presence, especially during the high traffic months, where where you can respond immediately and make sure that the controls that we do have in, in play are being followed, and as well as trying to make sure that we you know we provide the best experience we can, but at the same time uh, provide the best experience that we can with with the right appropriate staffing. But no, I agree with you completely, Councilor Gardner. Excellent. One thought I'm, I have also is that I, I, I like the, the concept of, of combining a posi the positions, but I do have a concern that if it's the community services director, if that's the title of this individual, of this position, then how does, it, it may be an additional step for anyone who does not know the town of Cape Elizabeth to say, I, I, I want to do something or I want to request a Fort Williams Park. If the, the title is Fort Williams Park Director or Director of Parks and Recreation kind of thing, I'm just, it's just a thought that may be a, uh, easier for someone to look up, access, figure out who that individual is that they need to talk to, it, rather than just title Community Services Director because Somebody, you know, we have people from all over the world that want something at Fort Williams and, and it might be hard for them to know who is the contact that they need to reach. Possibly. Just, it's a thought. P possibly community services and park director. Something, I, it, you know, can, it's just something that strikes me on. We I can work on that. Leave that to you, but <laughs> I just thought of it, that's we, all. We can definitely work on that. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? No? Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, Next item is a review of draft minutes of December 11, 2017 Town Council meeting. Are there any errors or admissions uh, on that? Anyone has noticed? I have one myself. Um, item number 24. Um, it's, it's a uh, type, uh, semantics and typing both, but one little change is going to fix it. Um, under uh, Perpudic Club licenses. Do you have, uh, I've got it right here on my mm -hmm. laptop, so yep. have you got it in a paper copy? Item number 24, uh, it's the first section, uh, and it says, Councilor Sullivan, uh, that the votes, Council having heard the disclosure of a possible appearance of a conflict of interest from Councilor Sullivan votes not to request her to re-recusal oh. relating. So either not request her to recuse or not request her recusal. Thank you. Either one I think would work, but that's the only I picked up. But is there, has anyone else seen anything? Uh, may I have a motion to accept the December 11, 
2017 uh, draft minutes as amended. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. No, uh, I'm sorry. Any, uh, any discussion? Any discussion? No. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Next item, item number 30, change to the off-leash area at Fort Williams Park. Um, on October 11th, the council referred to the ordinance committee a recommendation of the Fort Williams Park Committee to change the existing delineation of the off-leash area in Fort Williams Park. Chapter 7 dogs, section 7-1-7 dogs to be restrained on municipal property. We held a public hearing on December 11th and um, we deferred the item to tonight's meeting. Um, we, the, the agenda recommends we refer this back to ordinance committee for further review. Um, I'm sure everyone saw an email, two emails from a concerned citizen about this and I responded to this citizen saying we, we, we discussed referring this to ordinance because of the concern that maybe we take a town-wide look at dogs on athletic fields. But, so that's all I'm gonna do to tee up this item. I'd like to um, uh, turn it over to Matt. I know uh, our public works director is here and we'll speak to this as well. But if Matt could add uh, to this item and then we can and, um, ask Bob Malley to speak. speak. Sure, uh, 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 thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, the area that uh, was brought back this month was in, uh, instead of taking it, uh, or I guess we'll be making unleashed dogs uh, allowed during that time period. But I'm sorry, dogs only on leash would be allowed to be in there. And that was the edit that, that came forward mm -hmm. last, last month. Um, there's a couple of things here that the council may want to consider as far as uh, changes may go on this. Um, is there's two different things is the, the park specifically and the language related to that uh, which is what what's on the you know in the uh, in the field of view right now and then the other part would be looking at the larger scale uh, which council may want to do uh, in a separate in a separate item as well and refer that to the ordinance committee as far as the questions related or, or perhaps looking at the overall off-leash uh, issue within well, regarding two athletic fields, and that may be something for the ordinance committee uh, to consider as far as a, a, on a larger scale. Uh, we've run into that a, a bit up at uh, the Gullcrest property in particular, uh, where the where the ordinance is stated now is the, uh, the the groomed and maintained areas that are supposed to be on a leash uh, in that area and then off leash. But Gullcrest kind of got into a little bit of confusion. Then we put some new signage up there uh, right after the last council meeting to identify uh, the off-leash area as well as the leash area. Mm -hmm. But that needs to probably be formalized uh, or mm -hmm. formally looked at by, by the ordinance committee and then the council. Um, but Bob, I'm yeah. sorry. Yep, uh, yep. could Bob uh, come uh, Bob. up and speak to us about this? Would you like to look at the draft language that was proposed last month, or do you have particular questions? Or I have a question. Certainly. Is it, yep, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so just to clarify what we've already ascertained tonight that's before us that a couple citizens are urging us to vote on, is that in the fort, this athletic field is open for just part of the year, but only to leash dogs. Is that correct? Uh, the proposal, the original proposal was to prohibit dogs on the uh, multi-purpose field from April 1st to November 1st. And then there was a suggestion last month at the council that uh, the word unleash be inserted in front of the word dog. So if someone wanted to bring a dog to an athletic event, uh, they could bring their dog on leash. I see. So in, in the current ordinance, all dogs are supposed to be tethered or on a leash on any groom area or athletic field in, throughout the community. So that's the, that's the current wording in the dog ordinance in section 7-1-7. So what are we debating referring back to the ordinance committee if we're already saying that any dog on any athletic field must be leashed? We're, we're taking a look at whether they should just not be allowed on athletic fields at all? Is that 
I'm just That's trying to remember the discussion from last month. I think that, yes. I think that what was left was okay. there was there was an offer of, of just inserting the word unleashed in, in uh, at the start of that last sentence in paragraph B of seven dash one dash seven. But as uh, uh, town manager Matt Sturgis says, there's a larger issue about uh, the off leash area that the Gullcrest parcel is not designated or included in the description of the off leash area, which is sort of a a larger discussion if the council wants to pursue that uh, as a separate item to be referred to the ordinance committee. Uh, because Gullcrest was not included in that when it was created in 1999. So that's sort of part two, but the uh, proposal before you tonight is to, is do you want to add the word unleashed and consider that or refer the whole item back to the ordinance committee for further review? I mean, there was discussion also uh, that maybe even uh, a leash dog should not be on an athletic field because they, they still can defecate and people might not pick that up. And so that, that was something else that was discussed. That was another part of the thought of maybe the whole thing goes to ordinance. Um, and Councillor Randall? I was just going to say another thing that we talked about was whether, and I think you brought this up, Councillor Lennon, that uh, maybe uh, the dogs off leash on the athletic field should be year round. I think we talked about um, how mm -hmm. there was dog waste left on the field in the springtime from the winter, so that was something that we had talked about also referring back to ordinance. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked at um, the schedule, um, the town meeting schedule for the next few months, and there are no scheduled ordinance meetings at this time, which tells me that the ordinance load is quite light. <laughs> so at the moment, I suspect. And um, so what I, would, what I was thinking was, in response to a concern from a citizen, thinking that this, if, if this were to be, everything would be referred to ordinance, that this would be a very long, drawn out process. And it does not appear that it really would be. Because again, the fact that there are no meeting schedules tells me that there are no pressing issues or very light uh, workload and very likely ordinance committee would be able to address this issue right away is what I'm getting at. Uh, yeah. If I may through the chair, uh, January 22nd there is an ordinance committee. Oh, that I missed it. We're waiting okay. just uh, actually waiting somewhat from the results of this evening's meeting to see okay. uh, what that would be. The, the, one of the proposals uh, that is to be considered is the recycling committee mm -hmm. or perhaps adding uh, the um, renewable energy <laughs> concept to the recycling committee's charge. So, um, okay. but we're uh, holding for it as far as putting, uh, putting it on the schedule to wait and see. Until okay. We know what the council is going to do this evening. So, okay, great. What what other councils think about the concept? That concept of sending all of these issues to the ordinance committee to re re ramp this and review it. I mean, any other thoughts, uh, Councilor Randall? I think it may make sense to move forward on just this really specific mm -hmm. issue and then generally an ordinance talk about the issues at Gullcrest and the issue of maybe looking at all athletic fields throughout the town. Um, but it does seem like the ordinance committee previously uh, put a lot of thought into at least this one and, and mm -hmm. we can always come back and revisit it as we look at the larger issues, but just in terms of finality because um, there were other pieces to this particular issue in terms of, if I remember correctly, expanding that um, off-leash area, so it may make sense to move forward on this. Other thoughts? Councilor Lennon? I, I agree. Okay. And, and there's a lot of work, a lot of work went into this from the Fort Williams Committee, so I think it's respectful to vote on what we can, which doesn't mean it won't change again after the ordinance looks at it. I, I agree it's a good well, idea to send it to ordinance, but I agree too that this is very narrow and it, there's so much work has gone into this. I'm ready to vote on this and, send, and then send the entirety of the question to ordinance. I know it seems redundant, but yeah. Councilor Garvin, did you have anything? I completely agree. Um, I think both the, the two committees as well as other stakeholders that have weighed in on this, um, you know, have, produced a good and collaborative um, <clears throat> uh, solution here. I think, I think also I, I have a little bit of concern that, that 
light schedule of the ordinance committee notwithstanding, I, I do have a feeling that um, by introducing more far-reaching potential changes to this, that um, we're probably going to be inviting, um, you know, some significant input and dialogue. And so <clears throat> I'd hate to have the 90% of this uh, Fort Williams solution get held up with that. So um, I'm inclined to just move on this mm -hmm. tonight. Okay, fine. So uh, with those that consensus, should we then uh, entertain a motion and then uh, if a motion is seconded on this, then uh, have further discussion before voting. So I'm happy to entertain a motion. Councilor Garvin? I move that we um, adopt the changes uh, recommended from the Ordinance Committee uh, to change the existing delineation of the off-leash area in Fort Williams Park, specifically Chapter 7 of the dog section 7-1-7 uh, with the one um, edit being uh, the insertion of the word unleashed in the final sentence of se uh, section B. Is there a second? Councilor Lennon? Okay, further discussion? Uh, Madam Chair? Councilor Straw? Uh, uh, was it uh, an additional sentence at the end, or was it just the addition of the word unleashed? Just inserting the word unleashed to begin the final sentence of Section B, so that it reads, unleashed dogs are prohibited on the multipurpose field from April 1 to November 1st. Got it. Okay. Let's just take a moment. I'm yep. trying to pull that up so we're not... Okay. I was in... Um... It's page two of the October 27th memo from the previous chair of the Ordinance Committee. All right. Okay. Yep, there it is. So, do you have that? I do. It's also okay. in the, um, uh, excuse me, December, December 11th yeah. uh, Council uh, minutes, minutes as well. I was looking, that's where I was actually yeah. looking. <laughs> And then I went back to tonight's agenda. So, okay. So any, are you satisfied with that, Councilor Straw? Everybody else is clear on that? All right. I'm, I'm going to uh, oppose it because I would like to, uh, I'm in favor of no dogs on athletic facilities at all, year round. So I'll be voting against it. So any, any other discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, it passes four to one. All right. So item number 31, request to, oh, I'm sorry. Bob, did you have anything no, else? I'm all set, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Thank, thank you. you. Item 31, request, Can I ask I'm sorry. Just a point of information, Garvin? sorry. Yes. So, um, there's no specific urgency to do anything on it tonight, but will we then at our February meeting likely have a motion or an agenda item to consider of referring a sort of more wider yes. sweeping look, or do we, do we want to do that tonight? I'm well, I'm glad you brought that up because that, that's a quick catch of an oversight. We have that on this agenda item to recommend that we refer this back to the Ordinance Committee for further review. So. Uh, what should we do? Should we I, I, separate I may, motion? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, we already moved on that, yeah. obviously, but I, I, I'd like to be a little bit more clear in, and part of my objection to um, sending it back to ordinance tonight was I think we need to be a little bit more clear about what we're asking ordinance to do, which mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm really clear on tonight in terms of just reviewing all dog Ordinance reviewing athletic specific to use of athletic fields. I'm not. I'm not quite sure okay. what we're asking them to do. So I don't know if we want to, you know, freewheel on that right now, or mm -hmm. or come back with something for February. Again, I don't think it's exceedingly urgent, right. especially given the time of year. So, mm -hmm. but well, Councilman has a thought, and Matt does, and I do too. So I just was going to say I I I think it's a good idea to, if we can to vote to send it to ordinance to get it going. 
And I thought what we were asking the ordinance committee to look at is um, just prohibiting all dogs, leashed or unleashed, from all athletic fields. I thought that was what the ordinance committee, that was our charge, but I could be wrong. That's my understanding, but I, uh, let's see what the town manager has to add to that. In, 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 thank you, Madam Chair. In, in addition to that, there's also a clarification that we may need to have regarding the ordinance as far as their, their town home parcels, uh, such as Gullcrest, that right now the ordinance is silent on, and I think it might be helpful to, to Bob, myself, and the chief, uh, quite frankly, if we could you know, add the uh, areas that have not, or that had been overlooked because they were added after mm -hmm. the ordinance was created, and uh, that that may be helpful as well. And you know, we do have athletic fields at Gulf Crest, for instance, that would fall under the under the envelope or under the umbrella of the athletic fields question. But then, uh, you know, there's also the, the Larea parcel, which is basically ungroomed and unmaintained, so that would fall underneath it. But it may be helpful to identify that within the language as a town asset where that may be, uh, that may apply. Well, in that, in that case, then perhaps the thing to do is to ask you to come up with language and recommendation uh, for review for the ordinance committee and just, you know, in, in line with what Council Garvin is suggesting so that we have a lot, something much more specific. For, for the February for, meeting? Yes, for the February meeting, Councilor Straw. Is it going too far afield? There's a cleanup, uh, pun intended, issue that we've had uh, for a while with the dog, um, the dogs at Fort Williams, where Fort Williams is a carry in, carry out policy, and we have the dog disposal bins that technically are in violation of the carry in, carry out with Fort Williams. So, if we're looking at dog issues larger, it would be nice if we could reconcile that issue with the Fort Williams Park rules and the dog rules. Well, I, I think that's a very good point, and it does uh, bring up essentially some basic policy uh, discussions that we need to have. So. I think that's a great point. Any, any other thoughts? So we'll look forward to a recommendation at the February Town Council meeting for a language from the town manager referring to ordinance on uh, some clear specifics. And Council Carver? I, I, yeah, I would just sort of an inventory of the parcels and properties we're talking about, as well as um, in the cases where there are boundary issues, just clarity on what, what those are. So. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't think we need to vote on that, do we? I don't I've think got, so. I've got direction. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've got the chair. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. Item number 31. Uh, this is a request uh, to apply for resur a resource protection permit for construction of a boardwalk near the Cross Hill neighborhood. This is a request uh, by the Conservation Committee, and I will ask the town manager to, to uh, tell us about this. Thank you, if I, if I may, through the chair, I'd be happy to uh, present this. Uh, Jim Cassie was, was planning to be here this evening to speak about, about this project, but uh, he's home resting. Uh, quite frankly, he's got caught with a cold that is sweeping around through many different areas, so. <coughs> grateful to have him stay home this evening and he'll be back out Wednesday night for a conservation committee meeting anyhow so I'd, so I'd be happy to present on this. Uh, what we're looking at uh, is the conservation committee is looking to build an up to 600 feet of boardwalk up at the end of uh, up in Cross Hill at the end of Tiger Lily Lane there's a trail that wraps around the back side of Tiger Lily around the circle and it's uh, available to be seen on the map it's the blue trail that you see, and then along the border, uh, it shows the boardwalk uh, slash trail area. And there, there's a little yellow outline up at the top, which is an RP2 wetland that's been identified. In order to do anything within that area, uh, a person needs to apply to the planning board for an RP2, uh, I'm sorry, for a, uh, resource. a resource protection permit. Uh, it's, this has been done six or seven times in the past after speaking with Maureen uh, about this. Uh, it's generally, uh, you know, it's a, it's a mechanical thing to go through, but they need to get their permission uh, to do that. This is also, uh, you know, the, within the funding of the Conservation Committee, they have the money to, to buy the materials, and they have the good fortune of having an Eagle Scout who wants to do this as a project and create the boardwalk in that area. It's fairly low in, uh, low intensity as far as... Uh, as far as its impact on there, but it 
will be greatly appreciated because of the fact that it's quite muddy up there, since, hence it's an RP2 wetland. So the boardwalk should help as far as uh, maintaining the trail uh, integrity. But they are looking to do that. The, the boardwalk that they're looking to do is, is, is not going to exceed 600 feet, but it may be as much as 400, but somewhere between 400 and 600 feet long. Uh, and it's going to be four feet wide. And uh, that's the reason why we're here tonight, just to enable me uh, as a representative of the town to sign off on their application to go to the planning board. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion? Councilor Garvin? I move that we authorize the manager to apply for a resource protection permit to the planning board for the boardwalk as just detailed. Is there a second? Councilor Straw, any discussion? Councilor Straw. Uh, just to clarify, this is just for the application of the permit and not the expenditure of funds for the 600-foot-long boardwalk. Is that the, yeah, it, yeah. Just just to apply for that, the, right. they've got their, you know, they've got their budget to do their their project yeah. for them. Right. Right, and they they have an established and approved budget for the year. This, according to the document we received, is within that. They don't have to come back to us for that approval since we've for their spending their own pre-approved budget. They don't have to ask us for that. And uh, construction will be completed by an Eagle Scout candidate. So, And that, we have had um, some other projects in the past, uh, trail boardwalks and trail bridges built by Eagle Scout candidates. So that's, um, these are wonderful projects for those kids. So that's great. Any other discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Uh, item number 32, early budget guidance, fiscal year 2019. The town manager and department heads are in the midst of preparing a recommended municipal budgets for fiscal year 2019. This is an opportunity for the town council to provide early budget guidance. Um, as I, I wrote to the town council today, especially for our new councilors to tell them how this has come about. Um, it has not always been that we have asked uh, the town manager can, to consider budget, oh, an overall restraint <laughs> or number or percent increase, but we have done it at times. And um, we've heard both from former uh, town manager, Mike McGovern, as well as from Matt Sturgis, that this is very helpful. That they have a, a thought you know, in mind ahead of time. They can relay this to their department heads and so that that they have a little more confidence coming forward with what they want to propose rather than bring us something and have us just say, well, you know, we just can't have that number. So this saves people time and uh, it helps us all start thinking ahead. Um, so <clears throat> that's what this item is. This is just a discussion um, that we can have tonight. Um, uh, if we feel we don't have enough time tonight, we could all, we have a workshop in January, we could consider adding more discussion about this to a workshop. Um, as I mentioned to you um, in the past, we've, last year was a discussion about, well, let's keep this to this consumer price index for urban dwellers. I mean, that's not actually what happened, but you know, that's the sort of thing that we would have discussed and we have in the past. So I let the managers, you know, uh, address this a little bit and then we can open for discussion. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I know that at the end of last year's budget cycle, and, uh, when Chairman Sullivan was finance chairman Sullivan, she and I had a discussion about this, just kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of a recap of the season, of the budget season, saying, okay, what, what could be done better? What could be, you know, what areas could we improve on as far as long range planning? And one of the areas that we came in at had been, yeah, it'd be good to have a target or at least some general direction provided by council going forward. Last year was a great year because we came in at like, Nine tenths of one percent overall. So net wise, it was a it was a it was a it was a great year. Uh, but that was fortunate. Uh, so this year, going forward, and early in the process, it's great to be able to go forward and say, okay, uh, you know, you want to you know there may be areas that want to consider, uh, you know, such as the CPI where that's at. What came to mind recently was we received our bill from ASCAP for music and royalties that we have to pay as part of the annual licensing and they identified that uh, CPI was 2.1% and that's why they went up by 2.1% on the fee that they charge us annually. So uh, I've seen that, but then a lot of our other communities are looking at, you know, trying to get guidance as well because we're looking at, you know, for department heads, for instance, to plug in a number on, on, on 
compensation. What you want to use as a number to, to increase that by for, for employees. Or uh, for me, I look at it from the big picture, what's the bottom line going to look like and how is that going to impact the taxpayers of the town. Uh, so if I have general parameters as to what, you know, what guidelines you let me work with, then I'm happy to do that. The other item that comes into play on this are actually the other two items that come into play in this discussion are uh, two union contracts which are up this year and negotiations will begin uh, fairly shortly. They both expire uh, June 30th. So uh, that would be for the police union as well as the Teamsters at the public works side. So uh, that's a, a variable that hasn't been in play for three years. So. Uh, that's something as well that I'd like the council to, to have in mind to know that that's you know it's not in the center of your radar right now, but it's 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 on one of the outer rings and not as far out as it was before. So it's we're getting close to that. So that's something additionally to consider as we enter into the into the budget season. So, um, but any any guidance or thoughts that folks may have uh, from from on high, I'd be very grateful to receive now, so I can then pass that forward to my department as as they're crafting. As they're crafting their annual budgets right now. Anyone have any thoughts? Councilor Strong? Uh, as uh, we were informed during the audit review, uh, the unassigned fund balance has grown. Um, I would like to see a portion of that amount spent to bring us down to the, uh, the level that we would uh, otherwise want to have. Uh, how that money is spent, I would rather than having it handed back to the taxpayers, I would uh, rather see it used to pay for uh, current deferred maintenance that we have. So it, basically we're in a flush time period, we're in an upswing of the economy, now we should be paying for maintenance that otherwise would be occurring during a downswing. So I, I'd like to see uh, some expenditure in that area and in deciding should we increase by CPI, I would uh, caveat out whatever those expenditures are, set those into a different area, and otherwise, yes, close to CPI. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I would agree with that. I, I would like to see it under the CPI, uh, CPIU, um, and also because we have, we have been exceedingly fortunate this past year. Um, and so I think with, uh, with some revenues, and so, Kind of in the same vein with Council Straw, we have an opportunity for some of those to help cover other costs. So therefore, perhaps we don't need to, you know, raise our tax rates uh, anything, you know, significantly at all. And I, I certainly would want would not want to see anything over two percent um, myself. But anyway, Council Garvin, I just have a question. I think I've asked this before. Um, <clears throat> are there other benchmarks besides the CPIU that are used? Um, or is, is there, can you tell us a little bit why that, if it is the standard, why it is, and, or if there's other ones? I'm just curious. Yeah, oftentimes uh, that's one gets cited the most, I guess, because it's, it's the one that's pr produced most regularly. Uh, but there are other, you know, and there are very, various different CPIs that are out there as well that, that are employed. Uh, I remember back years ago, council had a discussion and you know, they were talking about three different CPIs, the CPIU and the CPI, you know, there's other other areas that they've used in the past. That's just one that it's normally hit. Um, it's often employed on Social Security as far as providing increases on that side of it. So there is some weight given to that as far as how that impacts seniors in town where that, you know, they may find that their Social Security may go up by a certain percentage comparable to that amount. So they've tied that to, well, our residents are you know, their incomes are going up by a baseline of this, so that's kind of been why folks have used that. Uh, other times, people have gone and just surveyed other communities to see where other towns are, what direction they're going in, and those are kind of, uh, they're not as, they're not as data-driven, I guess, um, but I know probably about a week or two from now, I'll see a survey go out across the, uh, across the interwebs saying, okay, what are you guys looking at on your budgets or, or, or whatnot? I know we have those discussions at, at the GPCOG level annually. I've seen those discussions take place between managers as well as elected. So uh, there's no one real, I guess my answer would be there's no one real guidepost to use, but the CPI has been the one that's, that folks have, have tied up to more, more than not. 
And rate of inflation has been another thing, but that's been kind of non-existent, or depending upon how you want to look at that. And, and there was some discussion as well on how the CPI doesn't take into factor uh, such things as uh, energy and food. Yeah. So. Or substitution principle. Yeah. So that's the that's the major critique that I read of it. Yeah. So that's that's kind of especially in years when gas was when, you know in two thousand seven two thousand eight when gas was going up to four bucks a gallon and oil was was chasing it as well. Uh, CPI was like two percent or less during that time period. It was like well. I know my cost of yeah. I know my cost of living went up I think, a lot more than two percent that year, but they, they take that out. So that is a, that is a detractor to it as well. So yeah. But um, what, if I could just provide yeah. one other thing, we are looking as I was saying in the audit uh, discussion as well. Um, we do have some fairly large ticket items that are we're looking at this year uh, with some you know some infrastructure work as well. Um, with the Scott, it's uh, on Scott Dyer Road. We're looking to set aside some money for that for, for phase two of a three phase project to complete that construction. Uh, we do have some money that we are receiving from, from PACs for that construction, but uh, there still is going to be a, a significant ticket that's related to that or cost that's associated with that. We also have uh, a fire truck that's coming on board, uh, is slated for this year as well. Um, that's part of a replacement process for. For that, but you're you're talking about a big number, as well as a, as well as a rescue slash ambulance that needs to be replaced and a dump truck. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a home for some of that good fortune of a, a, in the unassigned fund balance area. But but there are you know probably one of the best approaches you can do for using unassigned funds is to apply them to uh, capital items because. It, it's a, it's a good way to fund it if you have that ability versus saying there, there may be a, a unique way we can look at that from offsetting X amount of dollars that we have to pay to, to buy these assets in a combination with perhaps a lease purchase approach. So you may not have to borrow as much to, to, to stress that out over time, but, uh, but that's, that's still to be determined. But we do have, we, we can still find a use for, for the majority of that excess that we do have in there to, to buy some of those large ticket items so they won't impact the bottom line on the tax. On the tax rate, whereas they would in other years mm -hmm. if you had to fund that that purchase specifically with tax dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the um, issues about benchmarks, which are you know very important, but some of those won't come out for a while. And the purpose of this tonight mm -hmm. is to see if there are counselors that have some thoughts about you know something like well we've just discussed two percent, so it gives it gives Matt you know, a, a, a temperature taking to go forward. I mean, that it's not binding, it's not anything, but to go forward. So that that's really all this is. And we will later find out, of course, you know, as the spring develops, what other communities are going to be doing. Of course, the bottom line is, well, it, this is our community, <laughs> you know, so, but it helps to know what others are doing and what they're facing. And, you know, and, and you know, as, as Matt presents the budget, um, and shows us, you know, those those items that you know things like fire trucks and ambulances or whatever that have, we have to be replacing. While we'll be, you know, looking into all that in detail. So, is there? Um, two of us have mentioned that general figure as sort of a guideline. Is is anyone else? Uh, does anyone else have thoughts on that general uh, number of about two percent as a guideline? I mean, Councilor Lennon? Um I'm fine with that. I just. This is a little more philosophical or broad-based, but I think it might be really helpful for you and the department heads to take a quick look at the survey that the comp plan, it's just come back to us, they're answering, they're doing one extra little graph and then it's going to be made available for the public. And it's just a great way to get feedback from the citizens how we're spending their tax dollars and what they value. And it's, I found it very, very interesting, like, you know, what they prioritize, what, what, Granted, it's just a survey, but I think it's sometimes good when you're building a budget to back up and look really big picture and think, okay, well, I'm spending the taxpayers' money. What do they say they care most about? Just in the back of your department's heads, like if there's a decision and they can't have everything, what do the citizens want us to have? So that's just a suggestion, and I'm fine with the 2%. Yeah. 
All right. Well, unless there are any other comments, I think we can move on to the next agenda, agenda item. There's no vote required on this. This was intended to be merely a discussion. Um, all right. Anything else, ma'am? No, thank okay. you very much. I appreciate it. Okie doke. Uh, item number 33, request to purchase lot. Um, and I'm going to just turn this right over to Matt again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we have received, or the town has received requests from Mark Gresham and Sandra Elliott, who live up on Ocean View Road, to purchase parcel land that directly abuts them. That was uh, years ago. Uh, it was a tax foreclosure by the town. Uh, it was foreclosed on for non-payment of taxes. It also has a small paper street to the other side of it. So, uh, but they're looking at that 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 piece. It's roughly 8,600 square feet. Uh, it's also the second time that council has had this request made to them. Uh, the first time was back in 2007 by uh, Mr. Gresham and Ms. Elliott. Uh, at that point in time, they had offered $15,000 uh, for the parcel. And council decided that that, was, uh, that that wasn't enough. Uh, then they left the opportunity open for them if they wanted to come back and purchase, uh, if they wanted to come back with another offer that they were looking to, to, to they were open to hearing more. Uh, Time goes by, and, uh, things change, but uh, Mr. Gresham reapproached me this fall to say, I'd like to take another look at this. Uh, so what would the process be? So we spoke about that and we met, and I said, we'll come back with what you think would be a responsible offer, and, and then we'll bring it back to the council and the council can consider it. So Mr. Gresham came back with an offer for $35,000 uh, for the parcel. The lot is currently assessed at $18,600 and the only recommendation I have is that the council consider it uh, one way or the other, but uh, I don't have a dog in the fight, obviously, one way or the other. Uh, at one point in time, back in 2004, the Conservation Committee did take a look at this lot uh, on Ocean View Road, and they had no objection to the sale of that two-tenth of an acre lot, provided that a pedestrian easement was retained, and uh, they had made a uh, an offer for sale, a recommendation of $15,000, but the council uh, took that into consideration in their discussion back in 07 and, and didn't feel that that was enough uh, of an offer at the time. Uh, I went back and checked the minutes from that meeting and watched the video and the discussion from, uh, from the council uh, that took place. Uh, there wasn't a great hue and cry out of, out of the land as far as opposition to selling it, but there wasn't uh, any support for it at that, at that price level. Um, since that time, in 2007, the town has also established a land disp uh, disposal policy uh, that lays out the process by which, if the council decides that they do want to uh, sell a piece of town-owned land, that needs to be undertaken. And, and that's why I had uh, made the other mention here that the council considered it and they do positively receive the, uh, the concept or you may want to explore it further as far as potentially selling it, that the step from there would be then to refer to the Conservation Committee to get their recommendation uh, on deciding if the town should sell it or not. And then, then there was a, you know, multiple steps to take place after that as well, uh, as far as how to dispose of the, of the land. But if uh, council decides that they don't want to go forward with it at this point in time, then there's no reason to, to do the other as well. So uh, I think that's all I have on that. Okay. Uh -huh. so the Referral, if, if we uh, decided to um, proceed, the referral to the Conservation Commission would be for the purpose of uh, having them weigh in on the, pos the, the concept of uh, requesting an easement. Um, could you? Or, yeah, they may or, even say that they, they feel that this is a key parcel mm -hmm. to, to keep, or that they may, you know, the, the dynamic relating to. Uh, town-owned parcels has, uh, and the dialogue has changed uh, in relation to the Paper Street discussion as well. So that's something that uh, you know that they may, you know, it's it's now eight years, or for them, uh, let's say, 13 years later from the original recommendation, things may have changed. So uh, that would give them the opportunity to weigh in and say, okay, yes, we think you should keep it, uh, and so don't pursue the question any further. Or they could say, yeah, we don't have any problem. We should. Think about selling it, and, and and then, but then from there, the process lays out such as you need to reach out to the abutters mm -hmm. to see if they have any interest in it as well, and uh, and 
to try to basically make sure that nobody is feeling that they're being left out of the opportunity to try to buy it. And that's how they kind of how that policy has been laid out. Councilor Randall, so just to clarify, if I'm moving forward on this now, um, we'll just be moving forward on getting more information and then make a decision ultimately. Later Ultimately, uh, this this gets the ball rolling. Ultimately, uh, when it's all said and done, because so it would refer to conservation committee, then they would say, okay, we want to keep it, or or we don't see a need for this asset. And then from there, there are there are other decisions that flow from that, or things that we that the town will need to do to to make sure that it gets its proper exposure. So would the motion be? To refer it to the conservation committee. Well, I, I would. I think I would entertain a motion that said something like, uh, uh, "We uh, recommend that the town manager uh, consider this offer and uh, refer this to the conservation commission for further review." Something like yeah, that. That work. How does that work? It's good. Want me to make it? Yes, please. I move that okay. the, I move that we. Um, authorize. authorize the town manager to consider consider this and to refer it to the conservation commission for a full, a full view. Is there a second? Let's second that. Councilor Randall, any any further discussion? Councilor so Garvin, I just want to clarify mainly because this has become such a hot topic in the relation to paper streets. Yeah that this is very different from a lot of the other things we've discussed in the last year or so because this is a town owned parcel um, there have been a lot of other things relating to paper streets where the town doesn't actually have an ownership um, of any of the land or adjacent land that this is unique in that regard from some of the other discussions we've been having so i just wanted to underscore and clarify that point thank you great yep. point <clears throat> And we're just seeking, in effect, the Conservation Commission's opinions first before we then make further decisions on how to, how to proceed. Yes, exactly. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and there are, there are issues as far as uh, quieting the title because it is a tax acquired parcel. Uh, that there may be additional expenditures, yeah, expenses sure. that may be found. Yeah, so sure. so that may be part of the discussion later if the council wants to wants to wants to pursue that. So. In the, I think the last parcels that were sold from the town were back around 2005, 2006, maybe there was a couple pieces there. One on Mitchell Road, which now has a, a home on it, uh, across from Columbus, and then there was another piece that uh, that's down on South Street. There was a collection of small pieces in there that were sold as well at that, at that point in time. And that's when the policy came up after that. Council Straw? Uh, not to drag this out any longer. Uh, so it's currently not a buildable lot, it looks like, based on its size? I'm, I'm going to uh, echo Sorry. former manager Michael McGovern uh, when he was asked this exact same question. Uh, we don't want to weigh in Got it. as far as a, of a lot's buildable or non buildable status, and I thought that was a pretty wise thing to say. Fair enough. What the ordinance in Cape Elizabeth does not allow uh, construction to take place on lots that are under 10,000 square feet. However, there may be extenuating circumstances that, that may come into play that, that could impact that one way or the other. Uh, Mr. Gresham has indicated to me the reason why they'd like to purchase this property is quite frankly because it sits right next to them and they'd like to have the, the, the comfort of knowing that something was not going to take place on that parcel. Now for them, it's their, in, in a sense, their side yard. Mm -hmm. Councilor Randall? Also, not to complicate things and not to be <laughs> too much of a lawyer, but I was just reviewing the um, the policy and it looks like are, are we referring it to the conservation commission and to the town manager who shall survey all the municipal departments etc are we doing both of those things tonight because from the language of the motion it sounded like we're just referring it to the conservation committee so i just want to be clear what we're doing well thank you my understanding it is we're just authorizing the review the uh the uh referral to the conservation commission committee for further information gathering okay. and that that's all we're doing. Am I correct? Uh, yeah. I think that I think that'll work. I, I mean this is I just a the way we worded it was we're authorizing the town manager right. to charge or request to refer refer mm -hmm. it to I think that's the way we stated it. Is that right there? Um, actually you said to authorize the town manager to the town manager to consider the offer and refer um, 
the request to the Conservation Committee for further review. So, so what I would do is uh, reach out to, to the to Mr. Gresham and let him know that the council's beginning that process and just to let him know how the step-by-step -step, uh, status would go and, and we'll keep him informed as, as, it, as it develops. Um, he's home in and out, you know, he's, he's in and out because uh, he's a professional uh, ship captain. So uh, he's at sea often. Uh, so. so so this is just a very preliminary step that will gather information. There's nothing binding in any way. Uh, that's all this is. But we do need, apparently, to authorize the manager to take this step. So, anything else? Did we have a motion? Yeah, yes, we did. Yeah. We did. Okay. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, and we're now at the point in the meeting that any citizen who is present may raise, may, uh, raise a topic that is not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone wishing to do that? Seeing no one, may I entertain, a, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Randall, is there a second? Councilor Straw, all those in favor? It's unanimous. And we are done.